For the final installment of this little video series on practicing, I want to leave the normal practice space, church or practice room. And I want to go back to something that Charles-Marie Vidor said. It is not muscular effort that the modern organ requires, but a formidable and constant expenditure of mental energy. Now, the organ does need a certain amount of muscular strength. We have to train the very small muscles of our hands and arms and throughout the body to make the subtle and controlled motions that allow us to make music. But pushing all of our physical strength into a piece of music doesn't help us to learn more quickly. It's our minds that do that. We can use our brain to make practice more efficient at any instrument, and we can also use it to practice when a keyboard or an instrument is no longer available. That practice time in our minds is nearly unlimited, restricted only by how long we can hold our attention and the time that we have to give. Now, disclaimer. I haven't yet met anybody who thinks about music or music-related things every second of every single day. But if you want to add another edge to your practice, if your time at an instrument is at all limited, or if you wish you could practice more but your body really doesn't want to sit at an organ for a long time, these are all options to consider experimenting with. Mental practice is practice and can be done both in time dedicated to this or during any other part of the day. Riding in the car, waiting for an appointment, sitting outside enjoying the sunshine, or in one's office. Which again is why we've left the church for this. Under the umbrella of mental practice, I want to discuss five different concepts, most of which are tied to observation, just like our physical practice is so tied to listening. Number one, score study. When you meet a new piece, or if you want to understand an old one better, explore its background, eccentricities, and tendencies, just like you might a new friend. Ask lots of questions. When was the piece written? Who's the composer and where are, or were they from? If you can find this out, did she or he write it while they were younger, older, ancient? Does the piece itself suggest some kind of character, interpretation, tempo, or style? Take time to analyze the piece, getting to know details that you might miss when you're distracted by physical motions at the keyboard. Do any phrases come back the same way later? If so, great, you've already learned those bits or you only have to learn them once. But if it does come back, are there small changes? Circle the differences so that you can pay attention to them while practicing. When you're away from the keyboard, divide the piece into sections. I typically do this by phrase, so sections are anywhere from 2 to even 24 measures long, depending on the piece's tempo and complexity. I number these sections, and some of my longest pieces have had upwards of 150 sections. But this means that, in my practice sessions, I can write down section 78 equals quarter note 44, instead of something like page 32, line 2, bar 1, to page 33. This also means that I can jump around as I learn the piece. Related to this, see if any sections look particularly difficult. When you get to the instrument, start with these and solidify them first. If score study suggested, for example, that the penultimate page might be the hardest, start there, noting its section number, and then work forwards or backwards, focusing your practice on where it's needed. You'll then have tackled the hardest sections when you have the most energy and attention. Concept two, recordings. When you're just starting to learn a new piece, I recommend that you actually avoid listening to recordings of other people playing it. Why? Well, you need to get to know that piece on your own through your own practice, allowing yourself to be surprised by unusual harmonic movement or virtuosic passages, because you are going to be listening to what's going on and reading your own reactions. When we passively listen to a piece of music played by other people, we often do so without consciously engaging our ears and our minds. So the things that make music interesting, the expectations that are fulfilled or unfulfilled, actually can slide past without us noticing. We become biased towards what we've already heard and that familiar sound, and we try to imitate this, whether consciously or subconsciously, unless we actively work to avoid doing so. Again, think of this like getting to know a person. 
If you're solely asking everybody else what they're like, you're not developing your personal relationship with them. However, once you've had time just the two of you together and you've gathered some ideas of your own, go ahead and talk to other people, listen to recordings, gather more ideas, essentially asking others to share their impressions so that you can broaden your options. Concept three, once you've gotten to know a piece on your own, or if it's music that you aren't really studying, listen to and watch some good recordings and attend concerts. We learn by mimicking. Think of how a baby learns to smile. And this is both a conscious and a subconscious thing. Our brain is constantly analyzing what we see. Each of us have what are called mirror or imitation neurons. Neurons that change their activity as we observe someone else performing a movement with which we have some familiarity. We still don't know a lot about these, but neuroscientists have watched the same neurons fire in the brain of an individual watching an action as those firing in the brain of the person performing the action. The observer, in a way, solidifies the action that they are watching as long as they pay attention. Our visual mirror neurons activate the areas of the brain that control motion, whether we've muted the video or have the sound going. If you watch someone playing with smooth technique, your brain is learning a little bit about that smooth technique. Then this is reinforced when you go and try to consciously imitate those movements. This works best for motions within the realm of your established technique, which is why watching a gymnast perform on the uneven bars won't cause much motion in your mirror neurons if you aren't a gymnast yourself. Observation alone, of course, is not a replacement for practice, since your muscles do actually have to learn the movements. But we can learn even more quickly through watching and imitating as well as physically practicing. It also seems that we have an auditory mirror neuron system, and researchers have found that just listening to music also activates the part of the brain that controls our movements. So don't hesitate to watch with sound on when you're practicing this way. Concept four, have a mental practice session. But Caitlin, hasn't this whole video been about mentally practicing? Well, yes, absolutely. Score study, analysis, listening, all of this is practice, but here I'm talking about a mental practice session. An article by Ricky Brooks from 1995 states, mental practice for instrumentalists is stimulated whenever players mentally play through music. Players imagine how the music will sound and what it will feel like to play the music. Thus, a musical task is mentally conceived, rehearsed, and played in the mind and ear with the absence of sound. In contrast to mental practice, physical practice is the actual rehearsal of a musical task incorporating the necessary overt muscle movements needed to play the instrument, resulting in an audible product. So you can actually have a practice session without a physical instrument in front of you, running through parts of the piece mentally, remembering how the motions look and feel, and hearing those lines in your mind. If you often tense up at a particular point in a piece, imagine playing that part without tension as you practice. Practice difficult rhythms through clapping or through speaking and sing melodies. All of this helps you to get to know the music better. Practice leaps with your eyes shut, rather like tool number nine from the last talk, imagining the keyboard or pedal board before you. This teaches you to trust your body and is extremely helpful for getting to know an unfamiliar or less ideal pedal board once your body has met it and knows approximate distances. Try to see the part of the score that you are playing in your mind's eye and follow that as well. Imagine and rethink the phrases, training your memory and focus, since it's actually a lot harder to do this and to focus away from the keyboard. I did this before almost every competition, checking particular measures that were difficult and even running through entire pieces this way. Time on the instrument was limited, but I had unlimited practice time in my memory, which knew the competition organ at least fairly well. Athletes, musicians, and dancers all use these tactics to train their body and mind using a combination of mental and physical practice. Mental technique must be honed as much as physical technique, and this allows us to isolate the mental part so it can be as on point as the physical one when it comes to playing. You can also utilize this during your physical practice session at the instrument, pausing a moment in the frenzy of trying to learn things physically to refocus your mind and visualize a new or challenging moment. This adds even more variety to your practice, and we might be able to call this tool number 12. Mental practice can be done with the score in front of you, but does require using your memory when you close your eyes to really work and concentrate on a particular section. 
So as a small tangent, let's briefly talk about memory and memorizing. Through practice, we're trying to translate our reading and listening into long-term memory so that we can return to this piece again and again for years to come, playing it with far less effort than we originally needed to exert to get into our hands, feet, and brain the first time around. Thus, in learning, we have already committed much to memory. You probably have noticed that many musicians often perform from memory, while many others do not. If you're thinking about being a music major at university in the future, you might already know that all piano majors must memorize as a matter of course, and many organ degrees require at least a little bit of it as well. This trend towards playing from memory in performance only began a little under 200 years ago, legendarily with Clara Schumann and then popularized through Franz Liszt, who really started this idea of the legendary virtuoso above the mundanities of sheet music. Before about 1837 though, Playing a concert without sheet music was seen as arrogant and ostentatious, focusing attention on the performer and the performance and away from the composer and the music. In a study from 2017, German researchers found only a small influence of performing from memory on audience members' evaluations of performers. But as I've been charged to speak about memorization, let me do that rather than digress into more studies or history. By practicing, we are already seeking to memorize and internalize this music because we want to know it as well as we can, have it become a part of us. There must be no question in our mind what is coming next and what has already happened. When I perform, most of the music is pretty much already fully memorized because I know it just that well, yet I rarely perform without the score because I am far more comfortable and able to achieve my goal of making music when I give myself permission to have that bit of paper in front of me. It's a prompt if I need it, and includes registrations that are unique to the instrument at hand. It's really important to experiment with practicing to the point where you can play a piece of music from memory while continuing to listen to yourself and react to what you hear. If you can play and perform from memory and are more comfortable doing so, do it. We all have different skills and that is a great one to have. The mental practice that we're talking about right now will help you to become even more solid as you play by heart. However, if you struggle with playing from memory, it's still an excellent exercise to challenge yourself to do so. And a great way to practice this, once a piece is very well known and mostly memorized, is to try and write it out from memory. This is very difficult for most of us to do, and yet it's extremely satisfying to see that piece of music handwritten in front of you. Above all, don't let difficulty memorizing get in the way of your playing music, and know that improving your comfort at playing from memory can always be a goal of your practice sessions, both at and away from the keyboard. Memorization practice, mental practice, trains these mental muscles, and we become stronger players as our mental and physical muscles gain strength. Now, my final point about mental practice. Number five, plan. Well, of course, planning one's practice session happens both at and away from the keyboard. This is part of practicing and it's essential for cementing those reasons for playing and practicing and reinforcing these short-term and long-term goals that we've talked about and, in the end, making these goals achievable. You can plan your practice time on your way to school while waiting for class to start or walking across a park, brainstorming methods and things that you'd like to work on, as well as dreaming about what you hope to accomplish, both through practice and in the future. So, your final assignment, take out the piece of music you've been working on right now and practice a tough bit away from the keyboard. See how familiar or not you are with it in your mind's eye and see if you can start to fix something that has been challenging you. Let me leave you with one final wrapping up reminder. All of these ideas can be quite overwhelming when they've just been dumped in your lap all at once. Don't give in to that feeling if you're feeling it at all. Write down one or two things that sound interesting or intriguing and just give those two a try. When they're familiar and comfortable, come back, watch again, and write down one or two more things. Take bite-sized bits of information that you can swallow and that are useful to you and sample those first, adding more as you digest. Above all, vary what you do during the time that you spend with music, keep your mind and your ears open, and finally, Happy practicing.